Well, we only have uh, a few weeks left in Luke before we're going to be taking an extended break from our time in the gospel. So I'm going to invite you to open your Bible to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, where we'll be looking at verses 36 to 48. And as we've worked our way through these chapters of Luke's gospel, we've heard the call of Jesus. Jesus' call to follow him, to put our lives in his hands. And maybe you're sitting here this morning and you're just not sure, you're just not quite ready to do that. Maybe you're wary of putting your life in Jesus' hands. You know that he's showed us that his hands are powerful to heal and to hold that he's great and that he's powerful. But, but maybe there's just something about how you're wired that makes you wary of people with power. Politicians who will do whatever they must to keep their position, whatever the cost to the people they govern. Powerful people who use their wealth and their power to get richer and more powerful, crushing those smaller than them. Frankly, if we think about it, there does not seem to be a sphere where the power that exists has not been used for some corrupted means in some way. And maybe you're wondering if if Jesus has all power and if what we're being asked to do is put our lives in his hands, how is he going to treat us? How will he use his power? 20 years ago, if you were a Christian, uh, I think most people would have thought maybe You were kind of this uh, quaint conservative. It was thought of as maybe a more of an eccentric thing, relatively harmless, a bit odd, but to each their own. Now religion is dangerous, isn't it? Because not only does religion push against the social narrative that has been developing over the last 20 years, but it is also said to be about power, and it's about control. And so even people who think that Jesus might be for real and they can kind of hold back, and maybe that's, that's some of you today. They stay away. They just keep to the distance, the peripheral. They hesitate to get too close to Jesus because they worry that if it's all about power and it's all about control, in the end, it's just gonna, it's just gonna ruin their life. In the passage just before the one that we're gonna read today, we heard the voice of God telling us to listen to Jesus. We are to listen to him because he is God's great and glorious king. And what he does with his power is not what other people do with their power. It's not what the disciples expected. And if we consider the kinds of relationships we have with people with power, it's likely not what you and I would expect either. Jesus, he is the king, but he is the servant king. His position of power isn't one he uses to dominate but instead is one he uses to serve. And this interaction with power is very different than the ones we know in this world. In fact, it's very different than the ones that that can often be true of us, is should we have power. And while we can stand in judgment of the disciples who we will read are vying for power themselves, I think that Christ in his word through the presentation of a child shows us how much like the disciples you and I can be. You see, rightly recognizing the greatness of Jesus causes us to rightly follow him. That if we are going to say we are followers of the servant king, we will be servant followers. With that said, if your Bibles are open, I'll invite you to stand, if you're able, with me for the reading of God's word now. Luke chapter 9, verses 37 to 48. Listen as I read. This is God's word. The next day, when they came down from the mountain, A large crowd met him. Just then a man from the crowd cried out, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son because he's my only child. A spirit seizes him. Suddenly he shrieks and it throws him into convulsions until he foams at the mouth, severely bruising him. It scarcely ever leaves him. I begged your disciples to drive it out, but they couldn't. Jesus replied, You unbelieving and perverse generation, how long will I be with you and put up with you? Bring your son here. As the boy was still approaching, the demon knocked him down and threw him into severe convulsions. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back to his father. And they were all astonished at the greatness of God. While everyone was still amazed at all the things he was doing, he told his disciples, let these words sink in. The son of man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men. 
but they did not understand this statement. It was concealed from them, so they could not grasp it, and they were afraid to ask him about it. An argument started among them about who was the greatest of them. But Jesus, knowing their inner thoughts, took a little child and had him stand next to him. He told them, Whoever welcomes this little child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes him who sent me. For whoever is least among you, this one is great. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated as I pray for us. Father in heaven, by a work of the Holy Spirit, use our time in your word to change our hearts and further the glory of your name. We ask this in the standing of Christ. Amen. If you look back to verse 37, you're going to want to keep your Bible open. We see that the next day when they came down from the mountain, a large crowd met him, which right out of the gate is kind of classic Jesus, isn't it? He doesn't stay up in the mountain basking in the glory that is rightly his. He comes down and gets involved in a world that is hurting. We see that a man cried out from the crowd, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son because he is my only child. Do you hear the pain in that? My only child, Jesus, please save him. A spirit seizes him. You can see in verse 39, suddenly he shrieks and it throws him into convulsions until he foams at the mouth, severely bruising him. It scarcely ever leaves him. Some have thought this to be maybe a a kind of epilepsy that was not yet diagnosed, but understand that Luke knows the difference between a demon and a disease. Clearly something spiritual is going on, and whatever this spirit is, it is destroying this young boy. We read that in verse 40. What happened? I begged your disciples to drive it out, but they couldn't. Presumably, that's the the other nine who didn't go up the mountain with Jesus. Why couldn't they? Isn't that kind of strange? Do you remember back at the the beginning of chapter 9? You might just have to flip back a page or two to see verse 1, where Jesus had called the twelve all of his disciples together, and he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure all diseases. And if you see in verse 6 of chapter 9, what did they do? They went out from village to village to village, proclaiming the good news and healing people everywhere. What's changed since the beginning of chapter 9? I think Jesus' response in verse 41 tells us, he says in verse 41 of chapter 9, you unbelieving and perverse generation. It's an, a phrase that we get from the Old Testament. It has Old Testament roots. And the key word in this phrase is the word unbelieving. It means without faith. Faith in the Lord says, like we sung, Lord, I need you. I need you. You are my only hope. To be unbelieving, to be without faith, is to say, Lord, I don't need you. Actually, I'm, I'm fine without you. And where this phrase, you unbelieving and perverse generation, comes from is just after the Lord has acted in power to save the children of Israel from slavery in Egypt. You remember Moses goes up the mountain. He's he's being given the law. He's being authenticated by God as one with authority. And while he's up the mountain, while he's up there, while he's away, the people think, let's just do our own thing. Let's just build this golden calf. We don't need the Lord. We got this. And as we read those kinds of things now, we we kind of fall off our chair thinking, how can you say you don't need the Lord? If it wasn't for the Lord, you would still be a slave in Egypt. What do you mean you, you don't need him? What do you mean you're fine without him? It sounds crazy to us. And here in Luke 9, it's not the crowds are saying they don't need Jesus. It's Jesus' own disciples. Jesus has gone up a mountain and we're hearing the echoes of the Israelites saying, hey, we'll be all right. We got this. We don't really need you. We can take care of this one. And it's so obvious they haven't got this because they don't have the power to heal the boy. And what we've seen as we've read through Luke's gospel is that sickness and storms and death and disease, they are all symptoms of a broken world. They are all physical manifestations of the ways that people are in the grip of evil. A world that has been broken by sin. One where we say to God, actually, you know what? We don't need you. 
We're going to do our own thing our own way. We've got this. You say to do this, but, but we're going to do that. As you look around the world, it's so obvious that, that we've not got this. <laughs> and the more we try to do our own thing, the more of a mess we make of everything. In, in the face of that mess, in the face of all the things that hurt us, and all the things that hurt the people that we love, think about the need of this man's son. And we are so much like the disciples. In your life and mine, we, we hear the echoes of us doing our own thing, of our not needing God. When God says, live this way as a reflection of my holiness, as a reflection of my character, we live that way. And we hear the echoes in our actions of saying, actually, God, we don't really need you. And Jesus says in verse 41, you unbelieving and perverse generation, how long will I be with you and put up with you? What's his point? The point is, Jesus has come with power to save them. He has come with the kind of power that's needed to fix the broken world. We've seen that when the storm was stilled, when, when the demon-possessed man was restored to his right mind, the woman who was bleeding was healed. A little girl was raised from the dead. We've seen the kind of power that Jesus has, power like nobody else, power to fix the broken world, to do what no one else can do. Have you ever tried to help someone who, who doesn't want your help? <laughs> maybe it's a child with their, their homework, or maybe it's an elderly parent that needs to get their finances in order, or a friend with a relationship that's broken. It's so obvious, it's so obvious that they're struggling and you know you can help them, but they won't accept your help. Despite all the evidence to the contrary, they insist that they've got this. They're fine. They don't need you. It's exasperating, isn't it? You think, why are they being so stubborn? <laughs> why, are they, why are they being so proud? They haven't got this. You can help them. Why won't they just let you help them? And you get to that point, well, at least, I mean, I get to that point where you just want to kind of throw up your hands and say, fine, fine, forget it. Do it yourself or not. And you walk away. And it's in this phrase that Jesus uses in verse 41, we see just how exasperating we are, <laughs> how stubborn we are, how proud we are how we turn away from him and say, you know what? It's okay, Jesus. I got this. But you see, in his love, the Lord Jesus does not walk away. He remains with us. You see at the end of verse 41, what does he say? Bring your son here. But in verse 42, we see as the boy was still approaching, the demon knocked him down and threw him into severe convulsions. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back to his father. And they were all astonished at the greatness of God. The spirit was destroying this young boy. And, and we can worry at times that, that following Jesus is going to destroy us. What does Jesus do with his power? What does he do? He heals the boy. Jesus gives the boy back to his father. Imagine that moment. The man thought he was going to lose his son, and Jesus uses his power to heal and to restore him. Jesus is putting this broken world back together again. When we follow his words and we live his ways, that's what Jesus does in your life and mine. And you see it in verse 43. And they were all astonished at the greatness of God. The connection just keeps getting made for us. People look at Jesus and they see what God is doing, what God is like, and they are amazed. But while everyone is marveling, Jesus takes his disciples aside. You see that in verse 43? While everyone was amazed at all the things he was doing, he told his disciples, let these words sink in. In other words, listen carefully. Remember the voice of God? Listen to him. Now again, listen to carefully. Listen carefully to what I am about to tell you. Let it sink into your ears. The Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men. And that takes some sinking in, doesn't it? You can only imagine how, mar how hard that would have been to, to hear, to understand. The Son of Man is the Old Testament title for, the, for God's great King, the one who would be given power and authority over all the world. 
And it's a title that Jesus keeps using of himself throughout the gospel. He's saying, I am the great king with power over all the world, but I am going to be betrayed into the hands of men. And as he said before, he would be rejected and he would be killed by them. You see, he won't just let them be wowed by the healing. He is God's great king, but there is more to his greatness than his power to heal. There is his willingness to lay down his life and to die for us. Jesus has come to heal this broken world. He has come to restore us to the life with God that we were created for. Why is this world so broken? Why are we alienated from, from the life with God that we were created for? What is at the heart of the problem? It's our sin. It's your sin, and it's my sin. And because he is good, the God of the Bible says our sin must be paid for. I think we kind of get that at some level, don't we? We want justice to be done. We want evil to be dealt with. We get that. And the, and the great king comes with power to fix the world and to restore us to God. And the question is, how is he going to do it? Well, he tells us. For our sin, for our sin, he will pay. For our sin, he will pay. There is more to his greatness than his power to heal. There is his willingness to lay down his life and to die for us. And that's the kind of king the Old Testament prophets pointed to. A king, they said, of whom by his wounds we are healed. And we say, yes, he's, he's going to come. He's going to heal. He's going to restore. But how? He's going to do it by his wounds. In Colossians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul uses this extraordinary language to talk about how Jesus is going to restore all things. Listen to what it says in verse 19 of Colossians chapter 1. For God was pleased to have all of his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile everything to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on a cross. You see, Jesus has come with power to put the whole world back together again. But do you see how he heals the world? He heals the world by dying for the world. It is a good thing to find a man who will fight for you. It is an even better thing to find a man who will die for you. And as he's told them before, they don't get it now either. In verse 45, they don't understand. You can see that. It was concealed from them so that they could not grasp it, and they were afraid to ask him about it. The great king who has come to heal the world, and he does it by doing what? You just got to think how, how odd this sounds. And I suppose that 2,000 years of, of wearing crosses around our necks means we've kind of lost touch with the scandal of what this is, the scandal of the crucifixion. Because crucifixion wasn't just the cruelest way to kill someone. It was also the most humiliating way. Stripped naked and nailed to a cross, left hanging for all to see and to mock. The great king says that he must be handed over to public humiliation on the cross. And it's for your sin and for mine. And as you look throughout the gospel, it, it just keeps coming up that the disciples, they don't get it. And it's not until actually the very end in Luke 24 where Jesus says to them, and this is after he's been killed and after he's been raised from the dead, they still don't get it. He says, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things? You see the problem? They were slow to believe what the prophets had said. They weren't listening to God's word and and then right at the very end of Luke's gospel, we read that Jesus opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. Jesus is the sort of king that rewrites everything we ever thought about greatness and about power. Because in our culture, think about it, in our culture, if you have power, you use it to your advantage. You keep others down. You, you push yourself up. Oh, you might be okay with sharing some of it, but not too much. Remember, you're at the top. You see, there, there is a different sort of king here. 
Here is one with more power than anyone in the universe. And you see what he does with his power? He comes down. He comes down from heaven. He comes down from the mountain. He comes down into the depths of our pain and down to death on a cross. And we can worry that following Jesus is going to be bad for us. Look at this boy restored to his father. Do you see how Jesus uses his power for you to serve you, to heal you, to restore you to the life with God that you were created for? And we worry that listening to Jesus, to following him, will in some way be to our detriment. The Son of Man has come to be betrayed into the hands of men. Men like us. Men who think they didn't need him. So they rejected him and they killed him. And then he lets them. He doesn't kick back. He even prays for their forgiveness. If you ever think that following Jesus will not be for your good, be reminded of not only what Jesus was prepared to do, but what he did. In Galatians 2.20, Paul states, in a very personal way, So this isn't just something, a general truth, but one that is intended to be applied individually. So hear yourself in this. The Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Maybe you're here today and and you are wary of putting your life in the hands of Jesus. But do you see what he's like? His are the kinds of words you want to follow. His are the kinds of ways you want to live because this is the kind of king that he is. He's the kind of king that lays down his life for you. And the clue that that we have heard what Jesus has said, that we've really listened, the clue that tells us that we have listened to Jesus, the servant king, is that we become his servant followers. You can tell the disciples don't get it because you see in verse 46, look there, an argument started among them about who was the greatest. Brilliant. Jesus is the king who has come down and they are jostling to get to the top. It would seem like the the disciples are struggling with what we might call status anxiety. Think of it like this. You, maybe you, you go into a party someplace where you, there's a whole bunch of new people and the people you don't know. And what's one of the first questions that, that people will ask you? They'll ask you, you know, what do you do? Right? And I think in most instances, we, we're just trying to get a, a sense. We're trying to attempt to understand where the conversation might go, like who this person is, what they're about. But it can often be the case that there is an establishing of status that takes place as well. And maybe you've felt that in one of those situations. Who is more important? In the most blatant of cases, we find someone else to be important, and so we want to spend time with them. There's that cluster of people around that person. We want to spend time with them. But on the flip side, someone turns their back on us and goes to find someone more important to talk to. Let me tell you, if you're ever in a crowded room and you want a little bit more elbow space, Uh, Just tell people you're a pastor at a church and you will quickly understand how they understand you. You see, for some reason, we have tied the measure of status to a very narrow set of markers. What job do you do? How much money do you have? How beautiful are you? Maybe how clever are you? How many friends or followers or subscribers do you have? In any setting, we are constantly establishing hierarchies. And depending on the setting, the criteria for who is at the top, it's just a bit different, isn't it? We first learned this in school. We never actually drew up a table listing who was the fastest and the second fastest, or who was the prettiest and the second prettiest girl, or who was the smartest or the second smartest, or who was the worst behaved and then the second worst behaved. We never actually created a list and then taped it to the wall, ranking everyone, because we all knew. We all knew the answer to that. Because we are constantly establishing hierarchies. And the problem with hierarchies 
is that there's not much room at the top, is there? <laughs> and because there's not a lot of room at the top, it means that most of us, we're not at the top. Most of us are kind of way down that list. So in any argument about who is the greatest, most of us end up feeling bad. We end up feeling less than because we've been schooled that to be great, to be valuable, you need to be at the top. You need to be seen. You need to be recognized. And if we're not at the top, it means that we're not great. And if we're not great, it means we're not valuable. And if you keep going with this, maybe we believe that it says that we're, we're losers, we're failures. And on the darkest end of the spectrum, on the darkest end of the spectrum, maybe our life isn't even worth living. Maybe we shouldn't even be alive. The thing is, the, the argument about who is the greatest, this jostling for the top, it doesn't just happen among those who are kind of near the top. Realistically, right, there's only a few people who can be good at math in your class, be the tops. It wasn't going to be me. But even those who are kind of lower level, mid-tier, no realistic chance of ever making the NHL, right? That's not happening for me. That, that ship has sailed. It's possible that we can spend our time wishing we could be higher on the list because we want people to think more of us. You see, we are all caught up in this. In some sphere, whether it is in our classroom, our kitchen, or in the community here, we are all caught up in wanting to be great, of being on top. And the reality is, it is a miserable, miserable, miserable game. And it is a game that Jesus comes along and he blows right out of the water. You see in verse 47, look there. <clears throat> but Jesus, knowing their inner thoughts, took a little child and had him stand next to him. He told them, whoever welcomes this little child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes him who sent me. For whoever is least among you, this one is great. If I got a young child and I asked them, now, now what do you do? What does the child say? Let's just picture like a, like a three-year-old, okay? I got a three-year-old standing up here. What do you do? Their answer is, uh, I play, I, I, I have a nap, uh, I eat snack, I watch cartoons. And that is a life that most of us at this point would welcome, isn't it? <laughs> but let's be honest, that's not, that's not high status stuff. There's nothing great about this two or three year old that like eats dirt and watches cartoons. There's, there's nothing great about that. But what does Jesus tell his disciples who are arguing among themselves who is the greatest? Whoever welcomes this little child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes him who sent me. For whoever is least among you, this one is great. You see, children who by and large do nothing but take when they are little are not great by any kind of measure that we might use. By the what do you do measure, they are low status nobodies. They got nothing. But Jesus is saying, if you get him, you understand who the father is who sent him. And you will value the sort of people that your culture has taught you to think of as low status nobodies. Why? Because verse 48, look there. For whoever is least among you, this one is great. Jesus isn't establishing a, a different hierarchy, okay? The one who is least among you is greatest. No. This is a king who says, in my kingdom, even the people whom the culture has taught you to think of as low-status nobodies are great. Because in my kingdom, in fact, there, there is no status. There is no low status. You are sons and daughters of the king. You are co-heirs with Christ. You are a royal priesthood. You are ambassadors of Christ. Do you see how he says, welcome this little child in my name? In my name, in other words, this is how things are because this is what I am like. Of course, this is the great king. And in his greatness, he doesn't jostle for the top. He comes down. He lays down his life on the cross to serve us. In Hebrews 12, we're told that, that this coming down, this cup of wrath that he would drink in our place, 
was actually a joy set before him. He was happy to be the servant king, and he calls his servants, calls all those who will be his followers to be servant followers. But this kind of service is kind of hard to stomach, right? We all know it's hard because we all know the feeling of not being thanked for something. We all know the feeling of wishing we'd been recognized when we weren't. We all know the feeling of someone else getting the position we wanted to be called on in school to receive that award, to be seen as great. Imagine what it would do for your life. Imagine what it would do for the way that you follow Jesus if none of that mattered. If the only one you lived to please was Jesus, if the only thanks you needed was from him. I don't think that anyone can do this perfectly because the reality is you and I, we don't like to be little, do we? We don't want to be less than. After all, our culture has taught us to look down on nobodies. It gives us status anxiety just thinking about it. And so, so we find ourselves jostling for the top all the time. Pick the context and there is a top and you will fight for it. When we play status games in our life together here as a church, when we think some people are more important than others because of perhaps the job they have or, or how clever they are or the kind of money they earn or, or the Bible knowledge they have or the role they have among us as a community here together. Or when we wish people would recognize our gifts and praise us more or thank us more. When we want to be given that particular job in our life here together. And when we're upset, when we don't get it. You see, when it's all about me and my status, when it's all about where I am in the hierarchy and what others think of me, when we slide into that, we must look back at Jesus. He, the servant king, sets the tone for his servant followers. It's not about how I can use my power to get these people to make me feel important. It's how I can serve these people, the people that if you were to look right and left and behind you right now, it's these people. And for you and me, it might mean not getting noticed. And it might mean not getting cheered for. And it might mean never being thanked. But Jesus says, if you are going to follow me, comparisons will not be important to you. Jesus, the servant king, sets you and me free from all of that. If you are here and you are a Christian, you and I, we follow a servant king, which means our instinct should be to do what we can to serve the purposes of God, whatever it might cost us, without anyone ever knowing, ever knowing anything about it. That's hard to do, isn't it? You do something, you just kind of want to let it slip a little bit to somebody. If you're here and you are wary of following Jesus because you've been told that religion is dangerous, that it's about power, that it is about control. Do you now see what a lie that is? Our whole culture is about power and control. Our world exists within a system where I become more by making others less. That is the culture that we are steeped in. But do you see who Jesus is? The servant king. There's one group of people who should be different, and they are followers of the servant king. And that is what Jesus is calling you to be a part of when you place your faith in the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus and you follow him as your Lord. As a church, if we follow him, we will be a beautiful community that will be so different from the jostling to the top that we are used to. We will be a place where you can, where you can let your guard down because you know people don't judge you on the basis of what you do where people aren't looking for, for the most important people to talk to when we have coffee afterwards because there just aren't any important people here. There are no little people and big people. There are just a place where everyone who is in Christ is valuable, so there's no need to jostle for status. So the question we're asking if we're following Jesus is not how can I get you to serve me, to push me up the ladder, but instead how can I serve you? We need to listen to Jesus. And we need one another's help to listen to Jesus because his words and his ways, let's be honest, they don't come naturally to us. On the mountain, the voice of God said, this is my son, listen to him. 
rightly recognizing the greatness of Jesus causes us to rightly follow him. That if we are going to say we are followers of the servant king, we will be servant followers. May God help us to this end. Let me lead us in prayer. Jesus, we praise you that you are not like other kings. We praise you for the sort of king you are, that yours is that yours is all the power of the universe and you use it to serve us. We confess that by ourselves we do not have the power to be like you and so we pray that we would listen and we pray that as we listen to your words that by your spirit you would change our hearts. Good Father, bring about this change in our hearts, we pray, even today, some for the first time. We pray in the honor of your great name. Amen.